Thanks very much. Um, maybe just to start, has anybody heard me speaking before? Just a show of hands, because I spoke to some of you before. Okay, there's a handful. Okay, um, that'll give me an idea. Right, so, um, so the title of the talk is Biomedical Physics Accelerating the Fight Against Cancer. So it's quite a big topic. Um, I'm going to skip lots of it, um, but I'll try and give you a quick overview in kind of 20 minutes, and then I'll get kicked off, and we'll see how far we get. Okay, so to just give you an overview, um, just the first disclaimer, cancer is slightly complex. So there's kind of, I'm gonna try and cover over 100 years of work very quickly in 15, 20 minutes. So I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna skip a lot of the past, but I'll refer you to a good book if you wanna read about the past of kind of cancer and a biography of cancer. So I'm gonna mainly focus on the present, some work that's happening in the present and mainly the physics um, contributions and also some of the future work and the role of physics in the future of kind of cancer treatment. Um, so some, I'll just mention some of the big challenges as well. Um, a lot of, actually, can everyone at the back hear me okay? Or I switch on this mic here? Is everyone, can everyone hear me okay? Just wave at the back if you can't hear me and I'll switch this on. Um, so I'll mention some of the big challenges in medical imaging and some of the big milestones that have happened over the last 100 years as well, which are probably obvious to a lot of you from X-ray on. Um, and then some of the challenges in treating cancer. So obviously, we're probably all familiar. How many people in Ireland get cancer? One in three. So one in three of us are getting cancer and the rates are going up. So, but the treatments are getting better. But it depends on what type of cancer you look at because cancer is very complex. So if you look at prostate cancer, outcomes are very good and have been proven all the time. But if you look at lung cancer, it's not so good. So every type of cancer is slightly different. So treatments sometimes, and same with imaging. Imaging certain types of cancers can be quite difficult for different reasons. And one of the big reasons is motion, patient motion and organ motion. Okay, so we'll look at some two-dimensional and three-dimensional solutions, different technologies, or what they call imaging modalities. That's the way they tend to say it in the clinic, is different imaging modalities. Um, so the equipment, and. The, there's lots of acronyms, so again, if you pick up or look at this stuff up on the internet, you'll see loads of acronyms. Things like EBRT, which is external beam radiotherapy, so your cancer is inside, you're beaming the radiation through the patient. That's the most common type of treatment for cancer patients, external beam radiotherapy, and generally it's photons, so high energy x-rays from outside the patient. But you can also insert radioactive material inside the patient and treat from the inside out. So there are research going on with alpha treatments and other types of treatments, gamma treatments, internal. So you inject the radiation inside the patient and treat the tumor from inside out. But external beam is a common one. About 60% of cancer patients around the world will get radiotherapy and it tends to be external beam the majority of the time. Um, so the big challenge is this here. These are the two most important acronyms that you'll come across. Um, tumor, TCP versus NTCP. So it's very simple, kill the tumor, but don't kill the patient. And that's the challenge for physics, for chemistry, biology, clinicians, radiographers. This is the big problem. We can easily kill the tumor because what you do is you just dump in lots of radiation or lots, lots of chemicals, or you, what they used to do hundreds of years ago is you cut off half the patient, but then the problem is the patient dies. So if you put in too much radiation, the patient dies, too much chemi chemicals, too much chemotherapy, the patient dies, or too much surgical procedure, the patient dies. So again, if you look back in the history, for example, with breast cancer and things, what they would do to treat breast cancer 400 years ago or hundreds of years ago is they'd cut off the breast, but they'd also cut off the shoulder and the arm of the patient without anesthetics. Um, and that was, get, that was killing the tumor. So the tumor control was great hundreds of years ago, but the normal tissue complications were slightly uh, not quite optimum. Um, so this is the big challenge. And this trying to separate these two is a challenge for everybody, biologists, chemists, physicists, as I said, medics. Tumor control versus normal tissue damage. So how do we do that? And then the other big thing as well, because of cost, is to monitor response to therapy. So you're treating cancer patient, Treatment might go on over several months or several years. You'll, you'll know people with cancer and their treatment goes on for, it can be going on for decades. You'll know people with breast cancer and they're taking drugs for decades. 
Um, so it's expensive. One treatment could cost $100,000 for one treatment or 100,000 euro. So it's very expensive. So you want to know, and again, physics is involved here, how well the patient responds. And can you detect that early? Because if it's not working, which you'll find a lot of the time, or some of the time, um, you want to change treatment early because the tumor is metastasizing and growing. So you want to catch it early. And the problem in the past was you didn't know the response early enough. So the tumors kept growing and you didn't change the treatment quick enough. But nowadays what can happen if you've enough money is you can send your cells around to different labs and they can test different drugs on your cells and check the response in advance of your treatment nowadays, which is pretty interesting. So that's what's starting to happen now around the world. So it's what's called um, a new area of medicine called personalized medicine or precision medicine, or there's different names for it down here. Um, adaptive medicine, personalized medicine or precision. So instead of what was happening up until a few years ago, what happened was you prostate cancer, you walk into the university hospital across the road, everybody gets 74 gray for their prostate treatment, 74 joules per kilogram. That's the treatment for everybody. But nowadays, what's happening is they say, okay, Mark, you prostate cancer, um, but you're slightly different to the previous guy, so I'm gonna give you a slightly different treatment. So it's precision or personalized medicine. So that's the future. And also, if I have time, um, this is the main text slide. So I'll speed up most of the rest of the pictures. So that's why I'm spending um, quite a while on this one. Um, the future is also looking at, can you look at, say, for example, a mouse? and their centers starting to pop up around the world now where they have full small animal radiotherapy centers. So they're doing entire treatments on a mouse and then looking at the outcomes and then translating that to patients. So they have all the imaging systems that exist for patients for your little mouse. They're slightly smaller because a mouse is about that size. So the imaging systems are designed to image that size, but the exact same systems, which slightly bigger, exist for the patients and the treatments, they're testing, for example, you can use stem cells, you can use nanoparticles and different things, test it on a mouse. If it works quite well, you try and translate it into patients. So that's kind of a bit of the future as well. So we get there hopefully at the end. And I'll mention cost because if I have time, everything is very expensive, as you'll know. As I said, treatments could be 100,000 per treatment. So the big thing is, can you make, can physics help to make treatments cheaper? Can you design new imaging systems? For example, can you use light-based imaging to make treatments easier, easier or cheaper? But the problem with light is it only travels so far into the patient. Um, so a lot of this stuff is quite expensive. For example, if you want a proton treatment, to set up a proton center costs between 100 and 200 million. And that's why the HSE doesn't have one. So, okay, so picture time. Oh, this is just to mention. So this is the situation we are in now. Um, and this is kind of unfortunate. You probably heard about this in the media last summer. Five-year-old kid that was supposedly kidnapped by his parents because they didn't like the treatment he was getting in Southampton. If you heard this story in the media? Taken to Spain, in case you know it. So taken to Spain, then he was taken to Prague and treated on a proton facility because the NHS doesn't have uh, a proton centre. They will do in the next uh, year or two. They're building one in London and building one in Manchester. But they took the kid out of hospital, he had a brain tumour, and brought him to Spain, then they brought him to Prague, treated him. But the, patient, the parents were jailed and they were banned from seeing their kid. And the kid is still alive and he's had his treatment and he's supposed to be cancer free now. But they just didn't want to go for the NHS conventional treatment. And they decided that there was better treatment in Prague. But anyway, that's a little bit of a, an aside. Okay, so to skip the few hundred years, the past, all you need to do is buy this book, A Biography of Cancer, The Emperor of All Maladies. This is an excellent book. Anyone read this book? Okay, nobody bought it after the last time I spoke to them. Okay, uh, I recommend that this is the last time I spoke to you, so this time might, you might buy it. Uh, so nobody did the past research. Uh, this is a biography. It's, it's a really, really good book. It's won loads of prizes, and it goes through hundreds of years of cancer, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, surgical procedures, and it's fa fascinating. Um, it's patient, there's some patient um, kind of um, dialogue and things in it, but it's this radiation oncologist from the US. It's a really, really good read, and it saves me um, 40 minutes. So get that book. Okay, so 
is physics important? A lot of people, when you speak to me, you would think physics really is, isn't, has no place in radiotherapy and medical imaging because the physicists tend to work behind the scenes. So if you get cancer, as a lot of us will, we'll walk into the cancer center, you'll meet the oncologists, you'll meet the nurses, you'll meet the radiographers, but you never see the physicists because they're locked in the dungeons as we normally are. Um, but they are there, um, they exist in the hospital, and they're the ones that are working on making sure these radiotherapy machines work, they're optimized, um, they're working in companies, designing new uh, radiotherapy machines, designing new collimators and things, and designing new imaging systems. For example, a British physicist designed a PET CT scanner in the mid to late 90s, and that's every four years now, there's over a billion euro of those shipped around the world. So a physicist and a few of his colleagues just sat down and said, Joe, you know it would be a great idea. There's a CT scanner in that room and there's a PET scanner in that room. Why don't we stick them together? And he sat down with his engineering colleagues and designed a PET CT scanner. His university told him he was, uh, it was a great idea, but we're not really interested. And then a few years later, when they realized it was, there were shipments of billions of euro, uh, they took him to court and tried to get money out of it, but they lost. Um, so that's an interesting one where physics was used to kind of design a PET CT scanner. And I'm sure some of you have heard of that technology. It's used in cancer centers all over the world now. So there's been some fundamental discoveries. It starts probably the big one, 1895 when you got x-rays, but then around the 1970s, a really big one for cancer was CT scanners. And now, as I said, there's PET CT. In the last couple of years, there's PET MR. So it's a PET scanner and an MRI scanner stuck together, which is very complex physics, because you put a huge magnetic field beside charged particles, which doesn't really work sometimes. Um, and what they're working on now across Europe and the US is two different technologies. One is a SPECT MR, same problems, big magnet beside charged particles, doesn't really work, um, but they're going to do it. And there's also a, a linear accelerator with an MRI scanner. Again, this is a beam that's producing the radiation to treat the cancer, and you're putting an MRI scanner, attaching it onto it to image the patient while you're treating. Um, and this is something that's starting to hit clinics from 2017 on, which will change, I think will change cancer treatment for us, um, because MRI is not using radiation, where CT is. So you can scan the patient constantly while you're treating them and monitor. The big problem with a patient is, for example, take a prostate cancer patient. Prostate, you take your CT scan. So let's just quickly draw it. Here's your prostate cancer patient. You take a CT scan and there's the prostate and you do that on day one. So this is what happens across the road. They scan the patient and there's a prostate. That's great. But the problem is the, pa the treatment across the road goes on for five weeks. And what happens inside? If, you, um, if you're a physicist, you think your anatomy looks something like this. That's your bladder and your, that's your rectum. Well, your rectum is somewhere probably lower down there and hopefully a bit smaller than that. <laughs> but, uh, depends what you have for lunch. Um, but that's your bladder, your rectum. Let's, okay, let's not exaggerate. Your rectum is more central and it's over here somewhere. We'll translate it in there. But the problem here is this, all these moves. So you, you go for your treatment, you drink. They tell them to drink 500 mils of water. The bladder expands and this thing moves. But the imaging was done on day one. But what happens on week two when you're getting treatment? All the anatomy has changed and you just knew where the prostate was on day one. So now you've, if you're putting a lethal dose of radiation, because we said it's external beam, so the photons are coming in here, hitting this target, but the target's gone. So your TCP, your tumor control, is dropping and your normal tissue damage is going up. And this is the big problem in cancer. So you need to know where that tumor is um, and it's moving. And the other problem is um, the patient comes in, for example, this is another, there's loads of problems, but one to mention, the patient comes in for a prostate cancer. Day one, how does he feel? He's really nervous. He clinches his buttocks and he raises, he's lying on the table like this. They clinch their but, and they raise up off the table. So they actually, patients, if you look at them, or if you look at their scans, they tend to move up from where they originally were because they get so nervous to start. But after a few weeks, they kind of go, I'm going for treatment, and they relax, and all their anatomy changes again because they're just so used to it, and they go drinking the night before their treatment, and there's lots of gas in their rectum and stuff like that. So they're, people are modeling this. Physicists around the world are modeling the gas motion in their rectum and the organ motion, and that's big business using supercomputers to model three-dimensional and four-dimensional organ motion. 
So because the dose delivery is very important, you need to get it, you're putting in lethal radiation and you want to make sure that lethal radiation is in the right spot, otherwise it's not good. And you kill patients. You've probably heard of Lisa Norris in Glasgow, 15 year old girl killed because of her cancer treatment for her brain, um, which hit the media in the UK. And that's pro probably the reason why a lot of people are bringing their kids out of the NHS for brain cancers and things like that. But that's a famous example of um, a treatment that went wrong. So planning the treatment is big business. It's a lot of computer science because it's modeling, a lot of physics, and you have to understand the chemistry and biology and things as well because anatomy doesn't really look like what I think it looks like. Um, the bladder changes, uh, your rectum changes and distends and different things and that has a big impact on the patient. And imaging is very important and you can see here why you can find out when you start imaging patients, you think a patient looks like this, but actually when you image a patient you actually see some really interesting things that you don't think about. like their anatomy changing because of how they feel. So you put on music, you put nice lighting in the treatment room and you're trying to relax the patients. But what, sometimes the patient actually pees during treatment. So they urinate and their bladder shrinks in size and things like that. Okay, how long have I let? Half an hour? Okay, I'll speed up. Pictures, okay. So there's physics involved in immobilizing the patient. So laser beam alignment. So you can put tattoos on a patient and because they're lying on the table and they're getting treated here, so you need to make sure they don't move. So literally, you can align them with laser, beam, laser beams and things like that in the room, but also um, designing thermoplastic masks and things to clamp their head to the table, because if they move when they're nervous and things, the treatment goes wrong. So there's lots of physics involved in here in engineering. Medical imaging, we've mentioned. Find the tumor, tumor localization. Treat the tumor, so plan it, so there's lots of software modeling in advance of the patient coming in for treatment. So you go for your scan on day one, your treatment won't happen for a while because they're planning your treatment. So there's what's called a treatment planning room in the hospital and they're planning all the treatments for a few weeks. Patient positioning, treatment, and the last thing then is to check, is this working? So is there a response? Is the tumor shrinking or has the tumor spread? Because you have to decide, do this, does this person need chemotherapy, surgery, hormone therapy, and radiotherapy or a combination of each one? Okay, picture time. In the 70s, it wasn't very good because there was no good CT scanners. They were just starting to develop in the early 70s in the UK. So what they were doing is just beaming in large fields. And you can see here, this is the radiation beam coming in here, coming in here, coming here, anterior, posterior beams. So large beams, which meant tumor control was fantastic, but normal tissue damage, lots of collateral damage because the radiation is coming in. So what does it look like now? Quickly. These are the large beams from 1900s. So treatments have been going on for about 100 years. Um, and these, this is what you were sending in large beams into the patient, the, the lines here are the patient. Whereas nowadays you can what's called sculpt or paint, dose paint. So here the high radiation is this red area. So the target is within here and you try and reduce the dose to things like the spinal cord because otherwise you paralyze the patient. So you can actually shape or what they call dose paint so literally sculpt the radiation around vital organs, healthy organs. Okay, so the machinery is getting more complex, which means the doctors don't understand it and get scared of the machinery because they don't understand it. Um, so the physicists get involved in actually telling them how it works. Um, there's a lot of problems within the patient of modeling things as well and designing these imaging systems underneath the patient, this is the patient lying down here, to actually view is the tumor in the position where you think it is. So there's lots of physics there. Okay, let's skip this because that's just a picture of a, the machine across the road in the cancer center. It's not very exciting. This is the main important thing. It doesn't have a brain, so uh, that's the big problem. And that's why you get accidents all over the world. Patients die because you miss the target. Okay, so this is just a collimator. This is just shaping the beam and you can see there, you can design, we did some work. One of my PhD students did work designing one of these and testing it for breast cancer patients, trying to design a better this is just tungsten leaves that move in and out, motorized leaves to shape the radiation field before it hits the patient. So this is the beam coming through here. This is work we did in San Francisco where we're designing the actual, this little collimator here. This is not a patient, it's just one of the researchers lying here. And you can design this attachment to actually move the metal in and out for breast cancer patients. And we tested this on patients in San Francisco Cancer Center and it worked quite well. Uh, this is some new technology that's coming out. So now 
instead of just the machine, you have all sorts of other things in the room, alignment systems that all have to be tested by physicists and designed and improved all the time. Uh, you'll see more pictures here, imaging systems here. As I said, soon we'll have MRI scanners attached. This, this machine is producing the radiation beam to treat the patient, but it doesn't know where it's going. So you need an imaging system to actually make sure the tumor is in the right spot. Okay, so let's skip. This is old pictures, so we'll skip this. Uh, PET-CT, as I said, this is a big advancement in um, technology. It's just frozen now. So this happened around 2000, as I mentioned. So a physicist came along and a few of his colleagues, engineers, decided let's design a PET-CT scanner. And it was on the front of Time magazine in 2000. Five minutes, excellent. So as I said, in terms of shipments, you can see here, this is in millions of dollars, $250 million. This is PET-CT shipments around the world, or actually that's US shipments. Uh, you can see here it's worth billions of dollars. So this is just one piece of technology that a physicist decided to design. And now it's in most cancer centers. It's, there's one in Galway, but most cancer centers in the world have this. And there's newer ones coming out. This is an animation. I'll put this online if anybody wants to look, look at the animations and things. So we'll skip that. And what does it mean for the patient? So let's look at a patient. So this is CT planning. So here's your same cancer patient, brain cancer, brain tumor. The tumor is in here. This is just where the tumor volume is. Same patient, but this is planning with CT. This is planning with PET-CT. So the question you have to ask is if you're a patient, which would you prefer? Uh, this is your radiation fields. You can see field one, two, three. So this external beam again coming through the patient in three angles. Large beams coming through, hitting the target, but also hitting all the rest of your brain here. This one is PET-CT, same patient, but the, the plan is much smaller beams. That's going to preserve your healthy tissue better. But the question is, does it kill enough of your tumor cells? And that's th the question. So initially people said, there's no advantage. CT is fine. We've had this for years. Clinicians were happy, oncologists, this works perfect. But now it's been proven that PET-CT actually works an awful lot better. And now they're checking, is PET-MR the latest modality is pet -MR. Is that any better than PET-CT? And so far they're saying no. There's no reason to spend eight million on a pet -MR scanner. And the other thing to mention was response to therapy. So here's your cancer patient. These glowing things are not good. This is tumors. This is checking after chemotherapy. You do your imaging. This is good because it's light blue it means the tumors are gone. This person is a non-responder. So you can see clearly this person has responded to treatment this patient hasn't. So this is big business now because, as I said, its treatments are very expensive, tens of thousands of euro. Um, are the drugs working? If not, try a different drug. And you want to find that out early in your treatment. Okay, I'll skip that. So PETAMOR, as I said, is a new technology that's coming out. Complex physics because they used to use photomultiplier tubes in, in these systems. But if you put a photo, uh, magnetic, huge magnetic field beside a photomultiplier tube, things get slightly um, complicated. Okay, so let's get to the end. So the CT is the dominant imaging system still in the world, but you can see PET-CT from 99 when it started to hit clinics in the US, it's ramping up now for different cancers around the world, and it's still continuing that trend. Okay, so as I said, this is under development research across Europe. There's European projects funded to try and develop this technology. You can combine Pretty much any technology if you have time and money. Okay, so let's see. Obesity, I don't have time to talk about large patients, but most scanners have a 70 centimeter opening. If you, if you ever sit, I'm sure all of you have sat in a CT scanner or an MRI scanner at some stage, they tend to be about 70 centimeters. Problem is some patients are 500 pounds, so they can't fit in scanners. So that's another problem for physicists, is designing tables and scanners to fit in 500 pound patients. Okay, so. I realize I'm running out of time. So let's talk about some of the future work. So a lot of people are working with these fellas and de developing imaging systems. This actually exists, this is not a made up. This is actually a, what's called a rat cap. It's an imaging system uh, because one of the problems with imaging mice and animals um, is when you put them to sleep, everything tends to change. So you'd like to keep them awake. So brain function is the same and things like that. So these guys designed a rat cap with an imaging system to attach to a, a rat while he was awake and look at brain function and things. So this is kind of technology that happens in research labs. And in Ireland now there's, as I said, small an animal imaging systems and radiotherapy systems that exist. 
to actually test treatments on these fellows and then hopefully translate it into patients. Okay, so let's, so this is kind of where we're going. As I mentioned, testing things on cells, test your drugs on cells first, test that they work, check it preclinical on animals and then go to clinical applications. Um, so molecular, it's kind of a field called biomedical imaging or molecular imaging. Okay, we're very near the end now. Um, so you're going from things that are reasonably large to designing imaging systems to image a mouse, which tends to be kind of typically that size, or a rat or a rabbit. Or some people in Ireland work with imaging systems for pigs, for stents um, in blood vessels. Okay, so it's multidisciplinary. It involves biology, physics, uh, radiation oncology, the clinicians, computer science, molecular imaging. It's a combination. Everyone has to work together because we don't understand what the biologists say. That's, you can see that from that drawing of anatomy. Um, the clinicians don't understand what we say, so we go across the clinicians and say, we have this brilliant thing for you, try it out. It takes 15 years often for the physics technology to hit the clinics because the clinicians are afraid of it. They want to try it out, and there's hundreds of examples of that. Cost is a big issue, as I mentioned. Um, so you're trying to come up with new technology that's cheaper. Use nanotechnology, can you use gold nanoparticles, can you use light um, applications. The big problem with light is it only travels so deep, so you need to put the probe inside the patient. So it's invasive. And if you want to find out more, send uh, kids here to study physics. And one of the streams that we teach this stuff is in the biomedical physics stream. And I think I better stop because the caffeine is probably wearing off. <laughs> so has anybody got any questions? It was a quick fly through. I'll put these slides. I haven't given these slides to Mark yet, but I'll give those slides across and you can look at the animations and things. It all, that's, that's a really tough question. Um, it all depends on what, like you can, it, it all depends on the person, it, it's, it's look sometimes, because every cancer is so different, um, but you can look at investment. Investment in the HSE, investment in NHS, rubbish. Uh, relative to Singapore, relative to US, relative to Germany, you, you just have to look at the investment because we don't have protons, the UK, have a proton center outside Liverpool and Whirl, but they're not allowed to use it on patients. So they send 150 kids every year to the US and Europe if they think their brain tumor is worth it. But it costs $100,000 per treatment. So you often hear of campaigns to send a kid to America and to, to collect half a million to send them off because the treatments exist in the Mayo Clinic. So Mayo Clinic would be one of the famous ones in the US. Um, but having said that, you can go across the road with pro prostate cancer patients across the road. Most of the people with prostate cancer will die with prostate cancer. They won't die from prostate cancer. So if you have prostate cancer, don't go trying to collect 500,000 to go to the US because if you went across the road and got your treatment there for five weeks, you're, the probability is you're going to die with it rather than die from it. But if you have other types of complex, a brain tumor, and you're five years old, um, maybe then consider looking at proton, proton <coughs> options. And it's, there's options across Europe, Germany and Heidelberg to build new proton facility and things like that. So it's not an easy answer, but look at investment, look at the type of, the type of cancer is very important. Lung cancer survival rate is terrible and has been terrible for decades, it's not improving. You just can't, um, they can't crack lung cancer. But prostate's grand, breast cancer is very good depending on your type of breast cancer. There's loads of types as well, subtypes and things. Yep. Um, where is the greatest demand for graduates? Uh, biomedical engineering or biomedical science? Where, where do they go? Like, or where? Where is the greatest demand for graduate after the, after well, the qualified? In Galway, medical device industry is a big, med, Boston Scientific, Medtronic, Johnson & Johnson. We have all the big med tech, we have a huge med tech sector in Ireland. There's something like 35,000 employees in medical devices or something in Ireland. So Cregana Medical Devices Galway is a very good hub. Um, if they want to go the pharmaceutical route, Cork has a lot of hubs. You have the Pfizer's, all those companies. It all depends on what route. There's also the companies that design these. So Siemens, some of our graduates have gone into Siemens, Varian, Electa, um, or research routes into things like the one of my graduates that worked on the San Francisco breast cancer patients. He's in the Institute of Cancer Research in London now. And he spent the last four years there doing, um, looking at ultrasound imaging for liver and prostate patients. So there's different, 
it all depends on what route the student wants to take often as well. So, uh, but med tech sector in Ireland is quite good. And then abroad, obviously there's, abroad there's big employers. So, any other questions? Yeah, What's, John. What are the big cost drivers on the likes of um, photon treatments? Is it, is it like the, planning and everything? It's, the, it's, it's everything. The technology is huge and it's very complex. Uh, generally, it's how complex it is to design. X-ray machine, you could design that in your shed at home. You just need an electron beam and a target. Anyone could design it, so it's cheap. You can buy an X-ray machine for a few hundred euro. Uh, if you want to buy, build a proton accelerator, it's not as cheap. So if you want to design, say, if you want to make your own radioisotopes, you need a cyclotron, which costs about $10 million. Uh, so it all depends on the complexity of the machine and then how long it took the company to design it. Same with drugs. If it took them 15 years to design it, even though the drug might cost them a euro, they'll charge you 100,000 for it because it's the components might be that expensive, but it took them 15 years to develop it and they have the patents. So they're going to charge you whatever they want for it within reason. So it's often the drug, how long it took. So a lot of physics technology might have taken 15 years to get to the clinic. And then the scanners sell for one to 8 million. The most expensive scanners at the moment are 8 million for a pet MR. Uh, it's about 1 million for a pet CT. And same for your animal. If you want to get an animal, uh, we looked to try and get a spec CT scanner for animal imaging. It's about 1 million euro for your little mouse. So it's quite expensive even for a scanner to scan something that size. So we just design our own ones. It's cheaper to get a PhD student to do it. <laughs> so, yeah. Sorry. 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 Sorry.